Hi, and welcome back to my channel. In previous episodes, I spoke about the Revelation 12 signs. In the first episode, I spoke about the Revelation 12 sign that occurred on the 23rd of September, 2017. In the 17th episode, I spoke about the great red dragon that the Apostle John referred to in the Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, that refers to a large celestial body called the Nemesis system. In this episode, I would like to speak about the great red dragon that the Apostle John symbolically spoke about that refers to Satan. So in verse 3 and verse 4 of that chapter, the Apostle John was referring to a celestial body. But in verse 9, he was referring to Satan and his angels. Just as we are experiencing tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes, floods in different parts of the world, wildfires, and extreme drought, as the nemesis system is drawing near to our solar system. So also, as the time is approaching for the satanically driven government, headed up by the Antichrist to be set up on earth, we are seeing ethnic hatred, lawlessness, and religious conflicts happening all over the world. That is why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, and let me read it to you, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he had but a short time. It is clear that the effect of those demonic forces will be seen around the world and not just in a few nations. It is strange that the United Nations allowed a statue of a beast that resembles the beast described in the book of Daniel chapter 7 verses 2 to 4 and in the Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4 to be installed on their premises. And then two months later, it was removed with the explanation that it was only a temporary cultural exhibit. If it was only a cultural exhibit, why was it removed so quickly? The UN did not expect the response that it received that caused it to remove that so-called cultural exhibit. If that is not proof enough of the growing influence of spiritual darkness in the world, then maybe this next example will show us to what extent spiritual darkness is influencing our world. NASA, a scientific organization, has hired 24 priests in anticipation of discovering alien life and to prepare the world for such a discovery. They believe that the discovery of alien life might change human perception of who the Creator really is. Here is a brief video. Take a listen. Are hiring priests. I'm sure you're wondering, just as I was, exactly why scientists and priests are working together. They're complete polar opposites. Well, NASA is actually hiring priests for its next mission. That's because, as per reports, NASA essentially wants to assess exactly how humans would react to alien life. And that's why they want to understand how it really changes our perceiving of God and of how we were created, which is why they're actually going ahead and hiring priests. While the NASA program that I just alluded to is a veiled attempt to rewrite the creation story, there are others who are more blatantly promoting evil, like the leaders of the Satanic Temple. Here is a brief video. Take a listen. For watching, here's this news story. The Illinois Elementary School is offering an after-school Satan Club. The local school district is defending the Satan Club. It's sponsored by the Satanic Temple of the United States. 
The club claims it will help kids learn benevolence and empathy as well as, quote, personal sovereignty. We're going to the source on this story. Lucienne Graves is with the Satanic Temple and joins us tonight. Mr. Graves, thanks so much uh, f for coming on. So I have to ask, are, are parents complaining that there's an after-school Satan club at their children's school? Some are, but they don't have to send their children to the program. It's available for parents who do want to send their children to the program, and it's there as an alternative to religious clubs. If that is happening in a country that is considered Christian, where nearly 65% of the individuals in that country identify as being Christian, which is more than the percentage of Christians in any other country, then we should not be surprised that there is so much of Christian persecution. Here is a brief video. Take a Vice listen. Vice President Mike Pence vows that America will stand by the followers of Christ in their hour of need. He just made those remarks during the first ever World Summit in defense of persecuted Christians held here in Washington. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby was there and joins us from the White House with the latest. Good evening, Wyatt. Good evening, Lauren. The vice president says he and President Donald Trump stand with those who are tormented for their beliefs, no matter their faith. But he says across the world right now, no people face greater hatred than Christians. Over 215 million Christians confront intimidation imprisonment, forced conversion, abuse, assault, or worse, for holding to the truths of the gospel. So brief. Christian persecution has intensified since the COVID-19 pandemic. In many countries, Christians are finding it difficult to access essential medical services. They are not even able to access food at subsidized prices that they qualify for because they are from low income groups. These are the precursors to the great tribulation that will occur when the Antichrist is revealed. So you may ask, why is this happening now? And how are Christians to respond? The Apostle Paul in his second episode to the Thessalonians in chapter 2 and verse 7, spoke about the mystery of iniquity. It is only going to turn worse until the man of sin is revealed. With regard to how Christians are to respond, the answer is very clear. The Lord Jesus Christ is our example. He has led the way for us, and love is that way. You may probably ask if Christians are endeavoring to reflect the love of the Lord Jesus Christ by doing good, such as serving the community that they live in through Christian hospitals, orphanages, homes for the aged, relief agencies that offer assistance in times of natural disasters, then why are they being persecuted? It's such a paradox. We will understand why that is happening when we understand what that root of hatred towards Christians really is. Even though people persecute you as Christian, the root of that hatred is in a spiritual dimension. The Bible has already made that very clear in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 12, which I read just a few minutes ago. Take a moment and think about why the people wanted to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. When everything that he did to them was good, he fed the hungry, gave sight to the blind, made the lame walk, raised the dead, and offered the world eternal life. Even Pontius Pilate, an evil man and an opportunist, who cared more about his own position, could not find fault with him and wanted him to be set free. The fact is neither the Jewish religious leaders nor Rome understood what they were doing. The spiritual forces of darkness were driving them. That is why the Lord Jesus prayed to the Father to forgive them because they did not know what 
they were doing. In like manner, when the acts of Christian kindness to people irrespective of their religious beliefs are now being looked upon with suspicion and are being misconstrued as illegal acts intended to allure, induce, coerce or deceive and convert people of other faiths to Christianity, we need to understand that that is not a natural human reaction. People do not realize that they are being influenced by spiritual forces. And as we approach the time for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christian persecution will become more intense. That is what the Lord Jesus said more than 2,000 years ago that would happen just before his return. This is what he said. Let me read it to you. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That was Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. Those spiritual forces are not just attacking you. They are attempting to attack the Lord Jesus Christ shining through you. It is like Herod who went on a killing spree attempting to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a good time to explain to our non-Christian friends and to those who presume to be Christians what true Christian conversion really is. Let me begin by telling you what it's not. A person is not a Christian just because they are born to Christian parents, even though those parents may be followers, genuine followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every individual must come to a clear understanding of sin and the fact that man has been born in sin. And the consequence of sin is death. And understands that it is the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for sin and is able to save them and asks him to forgive them and save them that they are spiritually regenerated by his grace. That is what Christian conversion is. A person must want to be saved and converted. Such conversion can never happen through allurement, coercion, inducement, or deception. Besides, no human being can ever make that happen. That is a matter strictly between God and every sinner. Furthermore, when such a person is converted and they love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be willing to die for what they believe. And I have never met or heard of any person who is willing to die for what they do not firmly believe in. Let me show you the true Christians in the Bible. You read about them in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. They are the ones who died because they continued to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and were martyred by the beast. That is what the Great Tribulation is all about. Here is a brief video clip from an old movie called Covardis that attempts to show what Christians suffered under Nero, who was a type of Antichrist.
now that you've seen that reenactment of what Christians suffered under Nero, try to put yourself in their shoes and ask yourself, how would you respond if you were persecuted so intensely? It would be natural for you to become offended and ask, why isn't God stopping that persecution? Let me remind you what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Let me read it to you. These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killed you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. That was John chapter 16 verses 1 to 3. Paul, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, made it clear that love is the only way to respond even when people do their worst to us. I have just pointed out two signs, the first being the approaching nemesis system and the cataclysms that we are experiencing. And I also discussed growing Christian persecution, which is an indicator that the red dragon spoken of in Revelation chapter 12, which is symbolical of Satan and his demons and the Antichrist that is approaching. So here is what is coming next. The Lord Jesus gave us another sign that would precede the great tribulation and the resurrection. It is the revelation of the man of sin or the beast of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7, who is also referred to as the Antichrist. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, the Lord said that the Jewish temple would be desecrated by the Antichrist as prophesied by Daniel. One day in our not too distant future, when the temple is constructed and the daily sacrifices are resumed, Israel will be invaded by an army led by the Antichrist, and he will put a stop to those sacrifices, as prophesied by Daniel and confirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he will desecrate the holy place in the temple and demand that he be worshipped. It is at that time that the persecution of the Jews and Christians will intensify. That will be the peak of Christian persecution and is referred to in the Bible as the Great Tribulation. The reason I say that it will be the peak is because, as I discussed earlier, it is happening right now and will continue until the resurrection of the church. Unfortunately, some Christians who have not paid keen attention to what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 22, have misinterpreted it to mean is only assigned to the Jews and not to the church. That is not true. It is assigned to both the Jews and the Christians. The Lord Jesus Christ has already made provision for Israel to be protected from the armies of the Antichrist. However, when you read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22, you understand that the Lord said that those days will be shortened for the elect's sake. The elect are the church. The days that the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to that will be shortened because of the elect's sake is the great tribulation. Christian persecution under the Antichrist will be a reenactment of what occurred under Nero because it will be a Nero-like spirit that the Antichrist will have after he dies and then comes back to life. The Bible says that the spirit of one of the preceding kings will enter him. You may wonder why I did not like him the Antichrist to Antiochus IV, who was a type of Antichrist. The reason is because of what the angel revealed to the Apostle John that is recorded in Revelation chapter 17, verses 8 to 11. 
Let me read it to you. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. In an earlier episode titled Mystery Babylon, I discussed the woman riding the beast and what is meant by her sitting on seven mountains. In that episode, I also spoke of the seven anti-Semitic kingdoms, and I will not repeat myself here. What I will discuss now is what the angel told John about the seventh king, who is the Antichrist, and then went on to say that he is also the eighth, but is still of the seventh. That sounds confusing until you look at all the keys in scripture to unlock that mystery. We are told that one of the heads will receive a fatal wound, which may mean that the Antichrist will be assassinated, and then he will appear to resurrect from the dead. What the angel seems to be telling John is that when the Antichrist appears to die and then appears to resurrect, that the spirit of one of the kings of the preceding six anti-Semitic kingdoms will enter the Antichrist. Then in Revelation 13 and verse 18, the apostle John spells out who that person is. Here is wisdom. Let him that understand count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man and his number is six hundred, three score and six. The numerical equivalent of the name Caesar Nero in Hebrew numerology is six hundred and sixty-six. They used that code to refer to Nero secretly. The problem today is that most people who study the Bible are attempting to figure out who the Antichrist is by attempting to find the numerical equivalent of candidates that they suspect may be the Antichrist. They are clearly mistaken. When the Antichrist is revealed, he will be the seventh and not the eighth, whose name computes to 666. The Apostle John seems to be telling us that the spirit of one of the preceding six kings will enter the Antichrist when he appears to resurrect and then gives the numerical equivalent of that king's title and name. What the world will see is a world leader who will be possessed by a full-blown Nero-like beast spirit that will rule during the tribulation and will repeat his atrocities against Christians that occurred during the time that he was emperor in Rome. However, at present, there are numerous little antichrists that are persecuting Christians. They are the heads of regimes in countries where Christians are being persecuted. They are being aided by the apostates like Judas to bring false charges against Christians. Speaking of apostates, the Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, that Antichrist went out of the fellowship. So do not be surprised that when the Antichrist is revealed that he is somebody who associated with Christians, but was all the while an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. In an earlier video, I said that it is my understanding that America is the revived Roman Empire. That said, America is also the home to millions of excellent Christians, 
And I said, and as I said earlier, if such spiritual wickedness is happening in America and that nation will be judged by God, let it be known to the rest of the world that God's wrath is coming upon the unrepentant. Let us be resolute and harden ourselves like flint, by which I mean single-mindedly following the Lord Jesus Christ till the very end. And while so doing, let us also have tender hearts, even towards our persecutors, and follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, and pray that they too will come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul calls such a life as our reasonable spiritual worship unto God. Let us pray. Father God, I pray for every Christian believer that they will read your word and understand what your word says and that they will not become discouraged and offended, but that they will endure till the very end. I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower them and that they will refrain from hating their persecutors. I pray that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ will shine through every Christian to even their persecutors, that they too will come to the knowledge of truth and to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ will shine through every Christian, even to their persecutors, that through that they will see the love of God and that it is God's will for them too to be saved and have eternal life. In the precious, holy, and matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray. Amen.